moving on more towards the um, the portfolio side yep. um, of the uh, of the VC stuff. Um, so uh, we've got we've all, we've seen different kind of rules that work and don't work, um, and we've seen like Andreessen and and Y Combinator partners and all that stuff kind of say different things like mm. don't invest in married co-founders, do invest <laughs> in married co-founders, don't invest <laughs> in solo founders, do invest in you know. Co- so like there's there's all sorts of different um, rules. Do you have any specific like have you ever invested in a solo founder? Do you have any specific kind of rules that you stick to with your portfolio? Because you and your wife obviously and uh, I think Jody. Uh, mm-hmm. founded Tractor, right? Yep. So that's an interesting yeah, so, dynamic in itself. Yeah, and, and there is a disproportionate number of life partners in the Tractor portfolio as well. That's cool. So that was not done on purpose. Okay. But, you know, data, our data is suggesting that these people, you know, the VCs are like, there's that introduces a risk factor that we wouldn't have to deal with otherwise. Yeah. And that's one version of the same story. The other version of it is... This guy, these these people are committed to this thing and they can't just walk away from it because they're both in it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it might create interesting dynamics in it, but arguably if they've been together for a while and they start a business, you know, April and I have been together for 20 years before we started Tractor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, blanket rules basically don't work full stop. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and it... And I think that, you know, it also creates an opportunity, right? So if every VC is like from Pat Match perspective, we don't back married founders. Yeah. So what what in by default you're gonna have these bunch of businesses which could be amazing. Hundred percent. But they didn't even get past the first gate. So I'm looking at them going, right on Nath from Claymo, you wanna come and you know, you, you need you need a certain type of sh- shape of capital and help to accelerate your business. Like yeah. I don't have that rule. So yeah. how can we help? Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess it creates an opportunity on the other side of the coin. Um, you know, I'm happy for VCs to have their stupid blanket rules and then and, and say no to a bunch of people that, that technically create an opportunity if you were able to look at it through the right lens. Yeah, I, I don't think many of them do have blanket rules. I mean, I think they pattern match pretty hard and pretty fast early. Um, but anyone who's curious enough, I mean, when it comes to VC, it really does come down to the person you're talking to at that firm, at a partner or an analyst. Yeah kind of leaning into what you do you know like it's very hard to get someone who to care about something that they just don't have any interest in right so it's you know you're like if you're pitching b2c technology about something to someone who just doesn't identify with that like it's it's likely they're pattern matching and wipe it away straight away yeah yeah i agree um okay so question is um and maybe this is uh a general question um for people who don't know, who don't understand um, the startup ecosystem, what do the stages of funding look like from someone coming up with an idea and how might they get their first capital in your experience and uh, all the way to potentially what might be the end goal, which might be uh, an IPO or an acquisition? or what, what, do that, what does that look like usually? Yeah, like the traditional way is you kind yeah. of do a friends and family round, which right. is, you know, the people that are just going to give you money because they love you. Um, <laughs> You know, um, it's likely that, um, you know, they're not thinking about ownership stakes and how much of the company they get. They're not thinking about even what success looks like. Yeah. You know, they just want you to succeed. So, Would that be know, more of a loan, it, usually? Uh, no, a yeah. lot of the people, like you, you know, some, some. I mean, it, it varies. It's all lots okay. of different shapes and sizes. But but a lot of the time you'll see it as a friends and family round where they they, they, they take equity. Um you know, the challenge a lot of the time with that is is that, you know, they're, they're very, very unsophisticated investors yeah. and they're the kind of ones that are likely to turn around in a year's time and go, I'll give my money back. And you're like, well, <laughs> that's hard. Uh, it's very hard, if not impossible, without annoying the rest of the shareholders now. Yeah. <laughs> so friends and family um, is enough to hopefully get to the point where, you know, you can create enough of a product to do like a seed round um, where – the seed round is probably beyond your friends and family okay. uh, who, you know, you can sort of show them either a working prototype or enough fidelity in what you're building that people go, huh, oh, yeah, there's probably you've proven this in customers maybe or, you know, you may have the, the product out there but it may not be generating revenue or they may not be ready to grow yet but it's kind of sort of that inkling of something. And then they sort of go through these, you know, and there's like, now there's like pre-seed, post-seed, yeah, yeah. pre-series A. And it's like, what the hell does that mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. And they're all, it's all very confusing. And yeah. ultimately it, it, it ends up, 
the signaling, like what you call something yeah. is kind of indicates the type of people you're going to take money off. Okay. And those type of people have specific, usually specific, generally specific criteria they look for, yeah. for the companies they're backing. So a seed guy, a seed investor is not necessarily looking for revenue that's tracking up to the right at a rapid clip. They're like, they're looking for, is it a big market? Are you capable of doing this thing, you know, and taking a real punt on whether or not anyone will even like it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And when you start getting through to the sort of series A, series B, it's very become very metric driven. It's like, ah, uh, you're growing, but not fast enough. Yes. That becomes a real problem. Um, yeah. You know, I've got this saying that it's like, if you're going to raise money, especially like beyond friends and family, yeah. you know, um, especially sort of post-seed, you're going to raise money post-seed. It's like you either need an amazing story and amazing numbers yeah. um, or an amazing story and no numbers. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. People will back. Yeah, right. They're like, oh, yeah, that seems amazing. Shut up and take my money. Yeah. And the minute you've got some numbers, they're like, oh, those numbers aren't right. And you're like, well, what's right? And like, I don't even know what right is, but that's yeah. not it. You know, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, it's yeah. really hard to raise money after that. Yeah, yeah, wow. Crazy. And then is the end goal some sort of acquisition or an IPO? Yeah. I mean, a lot of companies get, you know, rolled up into other things. And it could yeah. be, you know, there's kind of, there's kind of two different types of acquisitions. There's the shit one and the good one. Um, okay. You know, the one where things aren't going particularly well, yeah. you really, it's really hard to raise money yeah. because all your charts are flattened out or they're not growing like you said they were or, you know, the market conditions have changed or something. Yeah. And you've built something that's great, but for some reason it's not growing like it used to. Yeah. And, you know, when a, a competitor or adjacent come along and go, look, we'll take you, your IP is okay, your team's great, you know, we're not really adding anything to our top or bottom line here, but we'll take it. And that's kind of like called an aqua hire where it's like uh, we'll gobble up the team and, yeah. you know, you've got 10 devs. I can't hire 10 devs to save my life today, so I'll just buy you and pop them over there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then there's the, yeah. the acquisition that happens because you're going really well yeah. where you're actually a threat to someone else. And they're like, ooh, that's, you know, if we wait too much longer, this thing is going <laughs> to it's going to be impossible to buy it or they're going to buy us and we better do something about it. Um and that's an interesting one, especially if you've got venture VC money inside you, because they're going to want you to keep pushing, right? And yeah. the balance between, oof, if it, is this number they're going to acquire us for, which hopefully will be big because you're good, enough of a return, or because they want to do that, should we just push through and keep going? Yeah. Mm. And then an IPO, like there's very um, there's not very many companies that actually end up IPOing really in the scheme of things. Um, you know, uh, especially Australian companies, yeah. the ASX is not necessarily the the most glamorous place to end up yeah. as a tech company because I think um, as a cohort of investors on the ASX, Australian mums and dads are used to dividend paying, yeah, right. you know, Telstra's and BHP's and banks and <laughs> tech companies are generally in growth mode, which means they're not yielding anything out to their shareholders. The shareholders are purely so the share price goes up. Yeah. Um, therefore, if you stick it in your, in your pension fund, it's like, that's great, but you know I need to pay my bills. Where's the dividends? Um, yeah, so so like, not, there's a yeah. there's a of investor that, that likes to buy this stuff. Yeah, it's definitely not the same um, mentality as the Nasdaq um, when uh, when the tech people are looking for a specific tech um, portfolio. That's right. Um, we've yeah. seen. So, yeah, yeah. So. 